Good morning, everybody. Well, welcome to Butamore Country Club, and welcome again to our CEO Breakfast and Strategy Series. I'm Tom Kunkel, president of St. Norbert College, and along with our sponsors, we are so pleased that you could join us again this morning. This is 18 years now that the CEO Series has been providing area executives with the opportunity to hear from some of our top area business leaders. This resource is being brought to you through the generosity of our presenting sponsor, WPS Health Insurance Arise Health Plan. Title sponsors are Wifley, Imaginasium, Insight Publications, Johnson Bank and Johnson Insurance, and today's sponsor is Bank Mutual. Please take the folders at your place with you and take some time to review the information therein. We'd appreciate it. Uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, ask everybody uh, to take a moment, uh, put yourselves, uh, let's put ourselves in God's presence. Heavenly Father, we have entered the season of Lent, which is a time of reflection and introspection. And that being the case, we occasionally are reminded in the ways at which we perhaps come up a little short um, of your expectations for us, help us in this season to summon the fortitude to do your will and to live the values that we profess in your name. Especially at this time of year, we always want to be mindful of those who are perhaps less fortunate, who may be doing without, who may be are struggling, do not have a warm place to stay. Please uh, look out for those in particular, Lord. Bless these fo this food to our bodies. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. Uh, we're going to have a nice breakfast, and we'll be back in a few minutes with what's going to be a terrific program. Thanks. Hope you enjoyed your breakfast. And please carry on with your, uh, with your coffee as we settle in here for what's going to be a real treat uh, with our guest, Kim Bassett. It's my pleasure to introduce Kim to you. Uh, she started her professional career at Bassett Mechanical in 1996 and has served many roles there including maintenance sales, maintenance sales representative, estimator in the HVAC and refrigeration departments, assisting with duct installation, working on rooftops with ammonia piping, and as a member of the business development team that's getting to know the company inside out. Bassett, she's going to tell you more about uh, this family company. It's a third generation uh, family owned company, started in 19. 36, so a big anniversary this year. One of the, the nation's leading mechanical uh, manufacturing, uh, engineering, uh, and fabrication companies based uh, just up the road in Kakana. Uh, in 2009, Kim was named president and chief executive by the board. She graduated with a BA and MA in speech pathology, interesting road to the CEO suite. From, uh, from Madison, and with a master's degree in management technology with an emphasis in construction from UW-Stout. She serves as chairman of the board of First Business Bank, vice president of the board for the Mechanical Contractors Association of Wisconsin, and she plays leadership roles in a number of other local and regional organizations. We are delighted to have her with us today. Please welcome Kim Bassett. Kim? I'm all wired up here. I'm just going to put this right here, it's just easier. So good morning! I'm excited to be here this morning and have the opportunity to share our story of business succession. Um, so this morning we're going to go over a company interview, just to uh, overview, excuse me, to introduce you to exactly what we do, talk about the transition and the succession planning, what we did to develop the team under my leadership and the lessons learned and then leave some time for questions. So we have three main lines of business. Our service division provides proactive preventative maintenance to the industrial and commercial facilities in the state of Wisconsin. So we do that through our Kakana, Madison, and Milwaukee offices. And our metal fabricating division, you'll actually see that big um, middle picture there. That was a 180 foot long vessel that got stood erect for the oil and gas industry. So we can build things that out of metal that go in the palm of your hands to things big enough to drive a semi through. And we ship those fabrications globally. 
And then the last division is the mechanical contracting division. And in that division, we're leading with ammonia refrigeration and bringing along HVAC, plumbing, piping, and controls. And we have a nationwide reach with that. So we follow our customers, the Heinz and the Crafts and the Oritas of the world. Um, we follow them nationwide and sometimes even go overseas to help them in some of their overseas facilities. And then we provide PSM, that's process safety management. PSM is uh, analogous to OSHA, it's a governing body and in the oil and gas industry and in the ammonia when you have more than 10,000 pounds of ammonia, they, you have to follow a lot of rules and regulations and so we help our customers with that. So the nice thing about Bassett Mechanical is that we're a mechanical contractor that can do um, the process from cradle to grave. So we have a number of engineers in-house where we can help you with the design concept, engineer it, design it, fabricate it, we have the crews in the field to install it, and then we can service it on the back end. And so our customers really appreciate that, that full service, one-stop shop. We were founded in 1936, as Tom had indicated. Uh, my great uncle founded the company. It was just him in a truck, and um, he grew the business to about two million with 32 employees uh, when he decided that it was time for him to retire. And so he was trying to decide, do I sell it to the employees? Do I keep it in the family? And so my father, who is here today, Bill, uh, is actually a, a chemical engineer. And we were living out of state. He was working for Union Carbide at the time. And his uncle, my great uncle, called him and said, would you be interested? And so he had grown up here in Wisconsin, so we moved back. I was just a really, really small child, so I, I don't want to age myself here. But he, he came in uh, 1974 and was named president. And that was an interesting time for him because he was put into this role where he was coming into the business automatically as the president, and um, his uncle could have done things a lot differently in that when um, Bill would make a decision or talk to the team and, and they were gonna go in one direction, his uncle would come behind and make decisions and give different directives and say, no, that's not the right way to do it. And you can imagine just how stressful that was. So Bill said if he ever had the opportunity to pass uh, the business on to the next generation, he would do it very much differently. And so when you look at what is the definition of succession planning, um, I'll highlight a couple words. The deliberate and systematic effort to ensure leadership continuity, retain and develop that capital knowledge, and to encourage individual advancement. That's what I got to experience. He didn't, not so much. So. I've grown up obviously in the family business and it really does start at the dinner table and the conversations that you're having amongst the family members. So my, my father was president um, and my, his father, so the, the founder's brother was in the business, he helped run the service division and then um, Bill's brother Jim joined about seven years after you were there, I think it was. And so it truly was a family business. And what I remember growing up is that the conversations were always positive, boring, but positive. <laughs> um, <laughs> I never in a million years expected to be up here talking about a mechanical contracting firm. And I'll tell you today, it's my absolute passion and I can't imagine doing anything else in the world. But my schooling really didn't take me originally in that direction, as Tom had indicated. I graduated from high school, Menasha High, and um, thought that he wanted me to be an engineer. And I never asked the question. It never occurred to me to just have the conversation. Maybe I could have gone into business, get a business degree. And so I went on a completely different path. And one of the things I always appreciated is they said, my parents both said, we will support you in whatever you decide to do. Follow your dream. And so I went to UW-Madison, didn't have any idea what I was going to major in. In my freshman year, back then, um, 
I was one of the last classes at UW-Madison where you had to physically run around the campus. A couple of you are nodding your heads. And so you had to sign up classes by going to the building. Well, you know how big that campus is. And I was the very last time slot of the entire university. So the seniors all get to go first on down, but then they alphabetize you. And so the BA through BM was the very last group of people to sign up. So I ended up with philosophy, Spanish, some classes that I would have never taken in a million years. But it was actually a blessing because I, one of the classes that had an opening was communicative disorders. And that really sparked my interest and took me through an undergrad and graduate degree at Madison in speech pathology. So I graduated from there and um, found a job here in the valley at um, St. Vincent's in Green Bay. And so I worked there for about three and a half years. And then I realized that really wasn't what I wanted to do for the next 40 years. And so I approached uh, my father about coming into the business. And he, we went through a bunch of um, testing, the career counseling, and do you have the leadership capabilities and the aptitude and all of those sorts of things. So I took a bunch of tests. And they said, yep, you've got the thumbs up. Now you need to go back to school again. And so I went to UW-Stout and got a degree in management technology with an emphasis in construction so I could talk the language. What's risk management? What's a Gantt chart? What are PMs, project managers, that sort of thing? And so um, uh, that was uh, really helpful for me because I was coming from more of a medical background. And this really gave me the platform um, and some credibility to really be able to talk the language. One of the things that we did then early on when I came into the business was the message from Bill was always, Kim is coming to join the organization because she is my successor. And everybody knew that right from the beginning. Um, and I had some really big shoes to fill because Bill over the years and his team had um, a great reputation in the in the community. Um, he had good growth. We had grown our customer base, and yet there were some things that we needed to do differently. And one of them was that you know when you're a small business and you wear multiple hats when you're you know 30, 40 people in an office, and all of his direct reports, it was. Everybody was directly reporting up to him, and they were all technical people that had lived in the world of HVAC, sheet metal, whatever it was, and they had moved into the office. And so they were peers, they were technical, they had been there for a long time, um, but there, was, there wasn't a lot of thought because as you're growing the business, you're focusing on the business and not the succession. And so there were some opportunities to do things differently when I came on board. One of the things that I really appreciated early on when I came into the business in late 1996 was Bill said to me, you know what, we have to have this relationship where if for some reason this isn't working for you, Kim, or if it's not working for me, he said, we have to be able to tell each other that, but at the end of the day, we'll still be family. And that actually gave me the get out of jail card because um, as I'll talk about, we're part, we were for many years part of the Wisconsin Family Business Forum. And so you sit around the table with a number of different family businesses and you, t you hear the stories of, oh, I've built this business for you, son or daughter. And the expectation is heavy on you then that you carry on the family name and the tradition. And that's a lot of pressure, especially if you decide that it isn't something that you want to do. And so there were a number of questions um, that we had to answer uh, going into our succession planning. And so I started in late 96, and Bill came to me and he said, well, your first job is going to be in sales. And I really? Because I've never sold anything, including a Girl Scout cookie. You want me to do what? <laughs> and so that was a little intimidating, but he had put a couple layers. There was always one to two layers between him and me. So the, my, the people that I always reported to were either directly reporting to him or two layers down. And that was important because the perception of nepotism was essentially uh, eliminated because um, people didn't see me. I didn't call him dad, as you see, I call him Bill. Um, you know, you just try to, to create this environment where people um, looked at me as the successor because I earned it, not because my name was on the front door. 
And so as Tom had indicated in, in the introduction, I had done a number of things. I did sales for about two and a half years, went out into the field. I wore steel toed boots and jeans, worked alongside our crews. Our sheet, we have uh, two unions. We have sheet metal workers and the pipe fitters. So I worked out in the field and in the shop for those seven months, hot of the hot, cold of the cold weather. And it was a phenomenal experience because I really got to see the hazards uh, from a safety perspective that you're up against every day out in the field and in the shop, what our customers' demands were. What I mean, there's, there's all kinds of learning lessons there. And that really built, built credibility for me. In fact, today, um, we have many long-term associates, and today they still will talk about the fact that Kim, I worked alongside Kim and had her do some of the worst jobs, and <laughs> they're pretty proud of that. Um, but you know, you really, I, I really had to be careful because um, I didn't want to be perceived as um, the, the lucky person that just got handed the baton, and so I had to work harder than anybody else and um, gave any job without it. I, I took on any job without complaints. So you can see the course of um, my journey. I came full circle back to the service division. I needed some management experience, and so I became the sales manager for about two years. That was at the time, too, where we had um, changed over our entire operating system, the software, and, and that was a, a really big, in fact, we have two, two, at that time, we had two systems that we were operating on. And, so I became the warden of the CRM and, and some different things and so, but it was, it was a great life lesson. And then in 2006, um, there was a full year where I, it was during that executive VP role where I finally felt I could get my arms around the entire business. I joined the board. Um, I would sit in Bill's office with every one-on-one -on -one meeting that he had with the executives so that I could learn what they talk about. I would do the annual reviews with him. Um, I was, we would go over the financials. I was learning what a P&L was and what made it up and, and um, cause how we do, construction is a little different cost accounting than, than others. Um, but that really helped me feel like I got my arms around the entire business. And so I did that for an entire year. Oh, I also did labor negotiations with him, which was very interesting. Because uh, there, he, he, the words of wisdom, he said, there is no common sense in labor negotiations. And that has carried me through to today. <laughs> uh, and then I served, uh, so, so I did the executive VP for a year, became president and COO for a year, and then two years later became the CEO. And I'll share a little story about that later. So on this journey of um, moving up the food chain in the organization, there were some things that we had to address uh, as a business and as individuals. And one of them was my style is very different than Bill's. Um, Bill is a big teddy bear and if you say, he'll say, hey, did you get done what we talked about? Well, no, I didn't have time, I was too busy. He'd say, okay, so when do you think you can get it done? <laughs> That doesn't work for me. So <laughs> if you tell me you're going to get it done, I will give you all of the resources, but you've committed to a time. And if you don't tell me otherwise, I'm going to expect that you get it done. So accountability was a really big thing. And it was interesting because people felt like the culture was changing. And one of the things that I had communicated early on to the organization and to my team was that um, that I wasn't, th there were certain things of the culture that I wanted to perpetuate, that family feel of taking care of each other, we will always be a family business. And yet, because of some of the things we had to address in the differences in styles, people are like, oh my God, the sky is falling, the business is changing. Well, not really, and we're just holding you accountable. We're putting metrics up and, so that was, that was something that we had to deal with and, and it was fine, but it was sometimes very challenging. We also, um, you know, the executives, the team that reported to Bill um, knew that I was in the business to take over the business. There were a couple of people, one in particular on that team, that wanted my job. And I think that was always a challenge for that individual because um, they felt like they were capable and there and had been there from very early on to get grow the business to where it was today and yet, here comes this snotty-nosed little girl that's gonna be taking over the business, how dare she, right? But we worked through it, we didn't lose anybody because of it, and um, one of the things that we did was um, very early on, we got outside coaches for every single person. So at the time, there were eight of us on the executive team, including myself and Bill, and other than Bill, the seven of us got executive coaches, and we did a 360, and we created a personal development plan and picked out three very um, 
tar big targets or goals, individual goals, so that we could work on being better leaders. And then we would share it. We would sit in a room and say, okay, here are the three things that I'm working on and I need you to hold me accountable to these and here's my commitment to that. And then those coaches helped all of us become better executives. And so that was really instrumental in helping build the team, um, and, and there are a couple other things that we still do today uh, from that. Um, with the executive coaching, I with my coach, I had two different coaches actually. For the first six months as an executive VP, I had a coach that helped me define who I am and how I fit into it. And, and one of the questions he kept saying, my coach would say is, what's your thing? Essentially, what is your legacy? How are you going to run this business? What is your thing? And for me, it was lean. So today, we run and manage the business through lean principles. But it, I, it was interesting because I was constantly trying to do it just like Dad did it. And he kept saying, you can't do that. We're a different business. It's a different time. You have to create your own legacy. And so that was really good advice. The second six months uh, of that executive VP role, um, I had a different coach, and that coach was more around how do we build the team, how do we get people working together better here, and so we did the 360s. We also did, and we still do today, what's called the huddle. So for an hour and a half every week, we have a set day and time where we get together and we sit down and everybody goes around the room and shares Anything and everything. We can talk about safety, operational issues, personnel issues, some strategic issues. We have a problem. We need to, whatever it is. And that was really important because as you grow, the CEO is always the last to know. And you'd look pretty silly if there were an incident that you didn't know about and someone approached you and you're like clueless. And so that was really big for us. The other thing that we still do today that I'd highly recommend if you've never considered it is on a quarterly basis, we do an outside informal gathering. So the executive team, sometimes spouses are included, sometimes not. One of us will host um, at our own home or a place of your choice a gathering. And so for example, if I were hosting it at my house, I would pick the main meal, everybody would bring a dish to pass, and we'd just make it a night of fun and getting to know each other better. And there's, there's only two rules. One, you can't talk business, and two, you have to have fun. Other than that, it, it, the sky's the limit. So that, <clears throat> that really served us well and set the basis for a successful organization or a su success, uh, successful transition, I should say. Some things that really helped or enabled my success were that experience in the field. Um, I, as I said before, people still talk about that. So that was a huge credibility earner. And you know, you, you saw it was a 10 or 12 year transition. Um, so there, I pretty much have done every role in the organization except accounting, and I still don't have any desire to do accounting. So I'll leave that up to the, the people that do that best. I also at the time had a spouse at home, and so I had young children. Um, I had children later in life, and um, that for two years he stayed home with my kids, which really allowed me to focus my energies on the business and not having to worry about getting them to daycare or whatever it may be, making meals. And that was, uh, that was huge, that was huge. The work-life balance, when I first started out, I thought that I had to be at every function that I got asked to be at or that was out there to really network and get to know uh, other people and have them know who we are. Even though we had been around since 1936, I just I felt like it was my, my duty in my role to get out and do a lot. And I'll tell you, you can get burned out pretty quickly. So I, I realized after about six months of that that there, were two, there, there was a rule that I would only allow myself two business function nights a week. So there were only two nights a week, and I, so I had to be very particular in choosing what I spent my time on um, at night being away from my family. And um, the other work-life balance piece was I was, when you get into the CEO role, um, oftentimes you have an assistant, and I really struggled with that person, you know, delegating things to somebody to that, um, that I just felt like were menial or personal things, right? I need you to get me tickets to the PAC for Friday night, please, at 7.30. I just, I felt really funny, but I did get over that rather quickly because she was phenomenal and it made my life so much easier. So if you don't have an assistant and you can make it happen, I'd highly recommend it. 
I also had a good support system, not only from my father and my family um, and, and having the spouse at home, the executive coaches, but I had an internal advocate. So um, many of you know Patty Van Ryzen. She was instrumental in helping move along the whole succession planning, worked side by side with Bill to say, here's where we're gonna go next. Although I will tell you when you see what would we do differently, um, we would have planned it out better, but um, nonetheless, she was very helpful. And she was, you need somebody in your organization that will be able to tell you, hey Kim, that really didn't come off well. And when you, you carry that title and you cast this long shadow, people are less likely to share that with you. And so she was the one that had the courage to um, be my go-to person and would tell me when, you know, that you could have probably done that differently. So she was a great internal coach. And then the Wisconsin Family Business Forum was huge for us to um, be, we were actually one of the charter members when it started. We, we stayed members for about a dozen years. And there would be different speakers, there would be panels. Some of you here have served as uh, panelists uh, at the forum's events. And that was really, really big because, um, for example, one of them that sticks out was the, the session was called Practice Dying T Till You Get It Right. And um, it, it spurred a lot of conversations, right? What do we need to do to make sure that we're successful in this transition? Um, the state tax and planning and all of these sorts of things that you think you know what you, you know, you think you know what you need to do, but when you get in there, um, you learn so much more. And then there were also, I helped found a couple of the peer groups because Nobody really understands being in a business and being in a family unless you're living it. And so to have peers that you could bounce ideas off of um, was, was really big. I thought this was a really interesting uh, snapshot of if you have somebody moving up in the organization, it helps them clearly understand the different levels and responsibilities, um, because as you move up, you're working less on the business, or working less in the business, you're working more on the business as you go up the food chain. And so this helps um, just give a snapshot in time of where you're going and, and do you really want to move up to a mid-manager level? Do you want to be a VP? Here are the expectations. So some of the lessons learned uh, for me, um, the, the separation, one to two levels of separation was really critical. Um, and it was funny because today, those people that I reported to years ago are now reporting to me. And it, it's worked really well. We haven't, th there was some chatter early on that, oh, we're gonna lose people because, you know, this just isn't gonna work. Can't tell you why they thought that, but that was their perception. And because of all of the things that we did and put in place, it, the, the handing of the baton was really a non-event um, because we had just lived, lived through that succession. Um, if I had it to do over, I would have decreased the amount of time spent in different roles, and that was the reference I made to earlier about having a formalized succession plan. We didn't have it spelled out to say, Kim's gonna be doing this for the next 10 years. It was, okay, we're gonna start her in sales. I did that for two and a half years. One year would have been, in my mind, sufficient, so it was a year and a half longer. They wanted to, that division had wanted to keep me in that division because I was successful and was helping him hit his top line, and so he didn't want to give me up. I think that played into it, but um, that, that I would have done differently in shrinking down some of the time, but the fact that I jumped around to different divisions was, was really good. We also learned in that process that not all department heads were good coaches and mentors. And so um, that, when I talked about when, when we did the 360, many of us had how to be a coach, better coach and mentor. Um, and that's what we worked on, one of the things that we worked on with the executive, with our each of our coaches. The job shadowing was invaluable. Um, to be able to sit at the table around the board, to sit in labor negotiations, to sit in those one-on-ones, to really understand the day-to-day -day business. I earned that right to sit at the table. I wasn't just given it. And that job shadowing for a year was, was really good. Um, and then I'll close with a couple different things. Um, there was, I'm, I'm rarely surprised. I usually configure things out, but uh, this was one day that I was very surprised. We had our annual board of directors meeting and um, sitting there and we're going through the, the normal 
things and, and Bill says, and I want to make an announcement. Today I'm passing on the baton to Kim. She will become the CEO and I'll get my first promotion uh, in over 30 years. And I went, what? I just, we hadn't really talked about it. And so I was really blindsided by that. And then in the next breath he says, and oh, by the way, we're switching offices. They're in the process right now of flip-flopping my stuff with your stuff. And I went, oh. Okay, what is in my drawer? I have a whole drawer of food. What are they going to find in there that they're going to, I'm like, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to find anything. And you know, at the end of the day, they did a fabulous job. But I was really struggling. I felt like I was kicking the bird out of the nest. And even though I had earned it, at the time, it was a little overwhelming. And I, I said, you don't have to do that. You, just let me stay where I am. And, and it was really good because Bill said, you know, if you're carrying the title and you have the responsibility, you also have to have the office so that people understand that you are leading the organization. And I said, oh, okay. Um, the other thing that I will tell you in closing is that I was always very thankful because Bill really stepped back and let me do my own thing. And that, I can't imagine how difficult that is to run your business and make it a success for over 30 years and then step back and say, here you go, it's yours, without meddling, without wanting to change things. I'm sure there were many times he wanted to, and I'll give you an example. We were in the midst of the recession, and um, we all know what that was like. And early on in that process, I um, was getting nervous, and so I gathered the team at one of our huddles, and I talked about we're really going to watch our expenses, and what do we need to do? We need to really cut back. And I learned months later, Bill said, you know what? He said, I didn't agree with you when you made that decision in that moment. But he said, boy, was that the right thing to do in hindsight. And so to be able to let go um, as the leader of the organization and to hand over the reins was a very difficult thing. But I'm always very thankful that he did it because that was huge. And in that, that is my story. <laughs> Questions for Kim? So, yeah. Um, for succession planning, do you have a management training program in place for the different levels as you continue on and your other managers continue? Yep, great question. So, the question was do, do we today have a succession plan for? different people in the organization and we're actually in the that's a huge undertaking we're actually in the process of creating what we're calling the leadership pipeline and so um, we are starting with our management level and defining who are our high potentials and what do we need to do with them and we have different tracks so there's a technical track because there are many people we have very highly skilled people in our organization that don't necessarily want uh, a managerial role, but they want to be chief engineer, for example. So we've got a technical track, we have a leadership track, and we're in the process of building that. So it, it, you know, today in today's day and age, um, especially with the millennials, they want to know where their path is, and so we have to create that vision for them and help them get there. So yes, yeah. Is there someone else in your family that you identified that you could start applying what you learned? That's funny, Tom and I were having the conversation at breakfast this morning. So I have two children. I have a freshman and a seventh grader. And, you know, I've always told them, follow your dreams. I will support you in whatever you want to do. And my daughter, when she was really little, a funny story, when people would ask her what her mom did, she would say, well, she's the president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Sweetie, I'm the first woman, yeah. Um, and, but today, it's interesting because um, my daughter has asked me, Mom, what does it take to get into Madison? I said, all right, well, you have to study hard. You have to volunteer her all the things you have to do. Um, and she asked me, what, what, what do you do in your role? And so, yes, those conversations are starting. I'm very careful when I come home, for example, from a long day or if something happened, um, to not complain or to uh, create a bad picture. But I'll say, you know what, it was a really long day. It was a good day, but it was a really long day. So you guys figure out what you're eating for dinner and I'm just gonna go sit over here with my wine. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so we've, in fact, um, 
There was a really neat program that was created uh, for the Family Business Forum that talked about what are the different things you can do to expose your kids. So, you know, brought the kids in for Bring Your Child to Work Day, and they've come into my office and sat there and watched different things. So, yeah, it starts from little on. Um, so I'm excited that she has an interest in it. We'll, we'll see where that goes. Yeah. Kim, you said, you know, when you did come into the company, it was understood that you were eventually going to run it. And you talked about this, you know, um, you know, all the stops you made along the way. But at what point in the process that you talked about did you begin to think that you could actually see yourself running the company? I actually always thought that. <laughs> um, the, the question was, at what point did I see myself being able to run the organization in my journey of going through various roles? And, you know, I really, really wanted to run it. I had the inspiration and the passion to want to run it. And so there was never a point where I thought, wow, this isn't what I signed up for, or, you know, why am I having to do this? Um, I always just gave it 110% and wanted to learn as much as I could. Um, knowing that that would serve me well in the future. And so um, I was a little blindsided when he, when Bill finally passed the baton to the CEO role. Um, but I had really been serving as the COO and the president, and so I was really doing um, a lot of the day-to-day -day, um, oversight anyway. But so there, there really was never a time where I, I um, didn't see myself doing that role. I don't know, you might have a different perspective on that. <laughs> uh, I think when we did the job together for a year, yeah. that helped us both. Yeah, that job shadowing. So you could see how I think and understand what you're doing. Yeah. So what's your favorite wine? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so when you are looking at your team members and looking for leadership qualities, what do you look for? Cultural fit is the absolute uh, first Thing. You know, you can teach skills, you can teach somebody how to do something, but that cultural fit is an inherent part of who you are. And so I, um, today, our executive team is made up of two, two people that have been there for over 20, 25, 30 years, and um, the other three or four are made up of one's been there for seven or eight years, one has been there for 11 months. So we've got a good variety, but when we're going out and looking for uh, that person, it's, it's cultural fit first and then the skill set second. Because, um, you know, we, we don't, we at Bassett don't believe in arrogance and, you know, titles are checked at the door. I mean, when we do our Kaizen events with Lean, um, the expectation is that an executive or a manager will sit in on every single event and participate and it doesn't matter if you're sweeping the floors, if you're welding under a hood, if you're the person that answers the door, the front, the, the phone, or if you're the CEO. We're all working together to just make the business better. Yeah. Many companies uh, are saying they can't find good workers. How do you recruit the people that you need with a high technical skill level? It's a challenge, although reputation helps us. People, um, you know, we, we often hear when someone comes in to interview, well, I talked around to the community, and I asked about Bassett Mechanical. You guys have a really good reputation, so that helps. Um, but we're also in the process of creating uh, our own, what I'll call, training academy, because very specific positions such as ammonia refrigeration technicians, ammonia refrigeration engineers, and our PSM, um, individual, pe the people that do the uh, PSM are really, really tough to find. And so we're having to train our own. And we're partnering with UW-Madison's engineering school. We're partnering with the technical schools. So that's how we're having to do it because they are, they're just not out there to find. And then uh, HR sometimes is pulling their hair out because even the recruiters can't find them. So we're having to do it ourselves. Yeah. Um, being that you're a female CEO and a male mainly male dominated industry, do you find that there's opportunities to try to broaden the um, base in terms of recruiting more female talent into the role or and, and have you seen that as an opportunity I guess for Bassett to lead the way? Yeah, so do I see it as an, op um, do, you know it's funny because everybody thinks oh you're in a male dominated industry, what's that like? 
I don't know because I grew up with it. I don't know any different. Um, when we're recruiting for positions, for me, the male-female isn't a differentiator. I'm looking for people that will be best suited for our business, for our culture, for our customers. And so I don't necessarily seek out females. Um, in fact, at, at the business, um, we have, if I had to do that, well, all of our field, unfortunately, I wish we had some females, but all of our skilled trades individuals are male um, administratively. Um, majority of them are males, probably, I don't know, 30, 40 of us women out of 375. Um, I would love, you know, the STEM, trying to get um, girls interested in science, technology, engineering, and math is important. Um, but again, when we're seeking out to fill a role, it's more the cultural fit and the capability than if you're male or female. But I would love to have more females. I'm, I'm not opposed to that. <laughs> yeah. Good question. How did we decide who we would use for the executive leadership coaching? Um, that was a bit of a challenge. Um, we actually had, for a number of years, worked with right management, and so um, one of their, Tom Wilsius actually served as my coach for that first six months uh, as the executive VP. In um, Actually, he served as the second, I'm sorry, he served as the second six months in getting the t building the team and whatnot. That first six months about building me and trying to figure out who I am, what my thing was, was more of a challenge, but we had to network um, and just started asking people, you know, Tom, do you know of anybody that would serve well as an executive coach? Phil, do you know of, and so it was just networking and we fell upon a, an individual that, um, <laughs> he, that was challenging. He would, he'd have, we'd be in a one-on-one -on -one and I initially met with him, uh, the coach, weekly, then it went to every other week, and then um, they were always there for me if I needed them, but we eventually, obviously, I moved on to a different coach. But that, that first coach that I had and trying to figure out what my thing was, he'd say, okay, here's a scenario, and he'd throw a scenario on the table, and he says, all right, you're in front of all 375 employees, what are you going to say? Go! Um, <laughs> made you think on your feet, so it was some good coaching, but yeah, it was a lot of networking. Maybe one more, Kim? Sure. There you go. Happy 20 year anniversary, by the way. 20 year? For me? Oh, it is 20 years. Oh my God. Yeah, at the end of this year it will be. 80 years in business. Yes, thank you. What's, uh, what are your goals for the next 20 years for Bassett? What are our goals for the next 20 years? To grow and be profitable. No. <laughs> um, well, you know, our mission, or our vision, excuse me, is cust creating customers for life. And so we really look for partnerships uh, in our customers uh, so that we move forward hand in hand and serving them. And, and of course, we benefit from that. And so I envision that we'll, we'll stay. We, are, we, we sit on about uh, 26 acres where our building is about 268,000 square feet. So with lean, you're supposed to utilize the space that you have, you know, eliminate waste. But I could foresee us at some point maybe building a taller section so we could build even bigger things than we do today. Um, but you know, the next 20 years, I'd like to be able to pass on to a family member the business, um, leave a great legacy, continue to create those customers for life, and and provide for even more families. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. That was terrific. I'm always, always so interested in the, the stories, especially of the family businesses, not only on how they got where they are, but how they manage that uh, unique challenge of the businesses present and families present, you know, overlaid on top of one another. Uh, terrific. Thank you for being here. And Bill, thank you for being here as well. Um, and thank all of you for coming uh, today also. If you would like a DVD of Kim's presentation, Please see Amy Kundiger uh, right here. And I want to thank Amy for so ably pinch hitting for the Amy you usually see, Amy Sorensen, who couldn't be here today. I uh, hope you will join us for our next CEO Breakfast presentation. That's going to be uh, Peter McMahon, who is the president and CEO of Shopco. Um, he's going to be speaking back at St. Norbert College. That is going to be on March 24th. So we have a little bit of a break, March 24th at St. Norbert College. Uh, hope to see you there and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks.